In this video, we are going to go through the process of compiling and running a program and we'll try to see what happens when you actually go through the process of compiling and what are the steps involved in loading the program into memory and running it. We are basically going to use a hello world program and we'll be running on the x86 architecture that is the Intel processor that is available on the system on which I'm running this demonstration. So let's start with the simplest possible program in some sense, right? So what does a very simple kind of assembly language program look like? You can think of it this way. Essentially all that it says is, we have a label out here, which says it's a dot global with the name underscore start. This is a convention. What happens is that the assembler, the GNU assembler in this case, which I'm going to use, when it sees this particular symbol start over here, it will assume that this is going to be the entry point of the program, which means that the final machine code that gets created will be in such a way that this is the point to which the operating system will jump when it wants to start executing this program. Now the program itself is very simple. All that it does is it executes the instruction exit 42. What that means is it will return the value 42 to the operating system when it exits from the program. Now, what is exit? Exit is not an assembly language instruction. It is actually a system call, which allows a program to return back to the operating system. So in order to call the system, system function, we need to go through a process, which is basically, we move the value $60, the immediate value $60, into the register RAX. And Finally, what we'll do is we'll have this assembly language instruction called syscall, which will actually invoke the operating system. In between those two, we take the value 42, which is what we want to return and put it into the register RDI. Now, one thing to be clear about, I do not expect you to learn the assembly language for the x86 processor. All that I'm doing over here is primarily as a demonstration of what happens when you take assembly language and try to run it on a system pretty much the same sequence of events will happen even if you were doing it on some other processor, an ARM or a power PC or the RISC-V as we will get to later. What you do need to understand over here is you should be able to look at these assembly language instructions and even if you are not actually familiar with x86 assembly, get a rough idea of what is going on. All right, so let's take a look at what happens if we actually try to run this program the steps that we need to do is first we need to compile the GCC program, the GNU C compiler itself can be used in order to compile this. I will write the code into a file called red42.s and use the GCC minus C option. The minus C option tells the compiler to only compile the red42.s assembly language into a file called object code, which is named red42.0. After that, we will use the command LD, which essentially calls something called the linker loader. The LD command will take the red42.0 that we have, combine it with other system libraries which have standard functions, including the exit system call, and create an executable, which by default is called a.out. We will then run the a.out command. As you will see, it just pretty much exits immediately. And in order to see the output that was generated by that command, we can use use the uh, the shell operation echo dollar question mark. So let's try this out. I have over here already edited in the files that we need. So let's look at this. This red forty two dot s is exactly what I displayed earlier, and let's go through the process of actually compiling it. We run the command gcc minus c red42.s. It compiles and you will now see that there is a file called red42.0 that was not there earlier. Let's run the command ld red42.0 and when we do that and then type ls we'll see that a new file called a.out has got created. Now before running this program I would like to use one more uh, program that we have in the new compiler collection, which is called the OBJ dump. 
OBJ dump allows you to dump out an object file into assembly language code. In this case, what I'll do is I'll call OBJ dump with the minus D option. And as input, I'll tell it to take the file wet 42o which is the object code that got created from the .s file. There are a few things to notice here. The first thing it says is the file format is elf64, x86-64. What is this elf, elf? We'll get to that in a moment. It then says disassembly of section dot text. What is this section? It is one of the components of, a, of any elf program. Once again, we'll get to that later. It then shows that there is a start address in for which it has given the initial value zero. Eventually, of course, it will not run with actually this value zero, but while it has compiled it, it has basically converted it saying that this is the starting point of the program. This, like I said, it's a convention. And the instructions themselves are like this. What it says is, the first instruction is move $0x3c, which is the value 60, into the register RAX, move 0x20, which is the decimal value 42, into RDI and syscall. So you can see that the very first instruction took seven bytes. The second instruction also took seven bytes. And after that, uh, uh, we have another two bytes for the system call. So this obj dump is a very useful command. It basically allows you to take object code and dump it out into readable assembly language, or at least somewhat readable assembly language, so that you can see what happened when you compiled something. If I now run the same obj dump minus d on the a.out file, I'll find that there is something similar. I, in fact, I get exactly the same code. So red42.o is about 700 bytes of code whereas a dot out is about 4,600. Now you might be wondering what happened because after all the actual instructions in red 42.0 were only about 16 bytes or so. The remaining is essentially a lot of header information and various other pieces of information that are put together, including some calls to system functions, some headers and standard boilerplate, which is required for compiling a program. So what happens when I actually run this program? Dot slash a dot out. It has run and already exited and I have set up my terminal in such a way that the exit condition or the return value of the last operation is displayed over here if it is non-zero. In this case, it shows the value 42. Another way of looking at it, if you don't have the prompt set up this way, would be to type in echo dollar question mark and it shows you the value 42, which basically says that this was the value returned by the last program to execute. All right, so now let's look at a slightly more complicated program. It has a very similar structure. It once again starts with the global start and the dot text and the underscore start label. The hash essentially indicates a comment. And what I have over here is that I'm going to call a system call, which is the right system call. I want to write some data out onto the monitor or out onto the console. There are some parameters here, for example, the fact that the system call number is one, the file handle number is one, which is std out. The address of the string, what you can see over here is there is a string called dollar message over here. And message itself is a label down here, which basically says it is just ASCII text corresponding to the string. The number of bytes to be printed out is 13. We have five letters for hello, comma, and space. So that's another two more world is another file and the backslash n or the return key is one byte. So we essentially have 13 bytes that we want to print out and then we call the system call. After that, we move the value $60 into RAX preparing to call the exit function, set the value RDI to zero. It turns out that XORing RDI with itself is actually takes up less bytes than moving zero into RDI, both would have achieved exactly the same purpose. But this turns out to be a slight optimization which compilers generally do. And then we once again syscall the exit function and leave. How does this look when we try to compile it? I have a hello.s which basically contains exactly this code. Let me compile it, gcc minus c hello.s 
I can dump out the object code. And you will see that all of this code that we had over here at the start is still there, right? So we have the move 01 into RAX, move 01 into RDI, syscall, right? Move all the values. After that, we have move 0x3c, XOR, and a syscall. So in other words, the initial part of the code, all of this, matches exactly with what we saw over here. But then you will see that there are a lot of instructions that don't seem to make sense. There are a bunch of instructions out here that don't really match with anything that we wrote. The clue is in this message over here. And if you look carefully, you'll realize that what has actually happened is these are just bytes. 48 is the ASCII code corresponding to capital H. 65 is the ASCII code corresponding to small e. 6C, 6C is LL, 6F is O, and so on. Okay. So in other words, what has happened is the OBJ dump program did not know that this was supposed to be a string. And instead, it tried to interpret it as assembly language instructions and print it out. This is something important to keep in mind. Understand that the OBJ dump program could not really make out by looking at the bytes whether this was a legitimate program or just garbage. It tried to interpret it as a legitimate program because that is its job. In the same way, the operating system or in general the computer will take any sequence of bytes that you give it and try to interpret it as a valid program and execute it. So you have to be quite careful. If it turns out that you are doing, you have a set of garbage instructions over there, it is entirely possible that you can mess up the machine. Now in practice, that's very unlikely because operating systems tend to make sure that you cannot really damage anything on the entire system. You do not have the permissions to affect somebody else's code or in fact, even other things of yours other than the program that you are trying to run. But keep this in mind, the fact that a program at the end of the day is just a string of bytes. How you interpret it and what you do with it makes all the difference in terms of what is actually done with the program. So now what do we do next? We have already compiled it. We need to run the ld command, which will now compile and create a new a dot out, more or less similar size to what it was before, but it's a different file. And what happens when I run this program? I see that it prints out the message, hello world. The other thing that you can notice is that the return value of this program was zero, because after all, that is what we wanted to return. So these two examples basically showed us how, what happens when you actually try to compile a program, right? If we look closer at it, what we can see is the general process of compilation when we are talking about assembly language programs would be that I can write multiple different assembly language programs. Each of them would be put through the assembler and would come out as an object file, a .o file. Finally, the linker that is LD would take many such object files other object files which maybe come from the system, possibly also static libraries. In fact, what was not visible when I typed in the command ld hello.o was the fact that ld by default automatically links in some other files which are part of the standard C library. By linking all of them together, it creates something called an executable. And that executable, when I try to actually run it, when I type in the command on a shell or I open a menu and try to click on it, what happens is that the operating system knows how to interpret the executable. It basically sees that section dot text and says, okay, this is the program part of the executable. Allocate some memory for it, load all the bytes over there into that location in memory, and then jump to the beginning of that program memory. In the process, you might also have certain dynamic libraries that need to get linked in. And that will also be done by the operating system. That's not done by the linker. So the operating system basically takes over from the point that you try to run the executable. It loads the executable into memory, links in dynamic libraries, and finally runs the machine code in memory. Until that point is compilation. The linker basically is the end of the compilation phase. What happens if you are working with programs or languages other than assembly? Let's say you have a C program. You basically pass it through GCC, send it, and generate an object file. That will once again go into exactly the same setup. 
right? Once again, it will get linked along with various other object files to create an executable, get loaded into memory and run. As an example, let's consider a C equivalent of what we have. We now have the function put s hello world, right? It's just supposed to print out a string. Let's look at the equivalent hello program and see how that can be compiled and run. The program itself just consists of this. We know that the convention in C programs is that the main function should be called main. And that is the one that will get executed when the program actually runs. In this case, all that it will do is put as hello world and then exit. I'm going to directly compile and link at one shot by calling the command gcc hello.c. At one shot, it creates a file a.out. You'll notice that it is considerably bigger than the a.out that was created earlier. Part of it is because the C library tends to link in more functions and gives you a larger executable. There are ways of getting rid of a large part of that, but that's not really important for us. What happens when I run it? Of course, as expected, it prints out hello world. We can also try to disassemble this a dot out. After all, that's also some kind of an executable code. Now you will see that a whole lot of different functions are created. In fact, I need to put it through a pager in order to see all of it. And many new sections, right? There's a section called dot init. There's something called dot plt. And finally, I get to dot text. And the dot text part of it is, again, difficult to really understand over here, except that what we can see is that this start, all that it does is that it basically ends up calling the main function, which means that if I want to really see what is being done in my code, I need to search for main, which is way down here. What's actually happening in main? If I look at that, I will find that once again, just like I was doing in the previous case, I have some code which I cannot really interpret in this case, but ultimately ends up being a system call to the function put s and achieves the same purpose as what we had earlier. But what you can see clearly is that a whole lot of other library functions and so on are added into the code when you compile it from the C program. The reason for this is of course convenience. The C programming compiler has been written in such a way that it can take just your main function, add all the other requirements around it in order to create an executable and it provides you with a lot of functionality such as the standard input, output, stdio.h and various other things that are useful to, uh, that make it much easier to write code. Similar to C, we can also go ahead with other languages like Fortran. All of them compile into object code, which ultimately becomes an input to the, inter to the linker. On the other hand, if I look at a language like Python, this is something that is dynamically interpreted at runtime. So .py programs are not compiled. They do not become object code directly. What instead happens is that I have a Python interpreter, which is an executable, which can take in these .py programs and dynamically at runtime, interpret the functionality that is required from them and directly execute the operations over there one by one. The mechanism ends up being quite different from what we have only from the point of view of the executable and downwards do we really hit the operating system and the same procedure that we had earlier. Otherwise, what ends up happening is that the programs are don't directly get to see the operating system or the hardware at all. They are always interpreted through the executable that we have over here. There are certain kinds of just-in-time compilers that optimize parts of this and convert parts of the code into machine code, in which case we would have a combination of some kind of a dynamic library that would basically be loaded at runtime and would allow you to run things faster. So finally, let's take a brief look at the ELF file format. ELF stands for executable and linkable format. And as you can see what, as we saw in the case of the hello world program that was compiled from C, there are many different sections that get created in an ELF file. Each of those sections essentially corresponds to some part of the code which has some relevance. The dot text is of course the most important one that corresponds to the start of the actual executable 
program. Other sections might be RO data, the read-only data, which basically consists of pre-initialized variables. The dot data is variables that the program itself needs in order to execute at runtime. There could be other sections which basically correspond to different libraries or functions that are used by the main code. So the ELF file, in other words, makes it simple for different kinds of compilers, C compilers, assembly compilers, Fortran compilers, to generate a standardized format which the operating system can always interpret and load appropriately into memory. The convention is always going to be that the dot text contains the executable part that needs to get loaded into the memory and the operating system should then jump to the beginning of that code and let the program take over from there. Windows on the other hand uses slightly different formats and other operating systems could have their own formats for how the code runs. So this was just an overview of the different steps that happen when you actually try to run a program on an x86 processor. We will next look at what happens when you try to do the same thing on a RISC-V processor. RISC processor.